Somber Teacup Chronicles presents Arcane Academia. Hello, students. This is going to be one of our more darker lectures, figuratively and metaphorically. I want you all to take a moment and think about a time where you were near or on the verge of death, lost in a storm, or in the aftermath of a catastrophe. Now that I have given you all a moment, I want to ask you all a couple questions. Have you ever seen a light you cannot explain and defies all logic? Does that light move as though it is not attached to anything? Does the light fill you with comfort, determination, and an amount of strength that you might have thought you have exhausted? Did you ever chase that light only for you to never reach it, no matter how fast or how far you chased it? If you have, you might have encountered a torchbearer. Almost nothing is known about these entities, despite how widespread this phenomena is. Many of our colleagues have experienced what I have just asked you and also cannot explain what they were feeling. Several of them are not religious, but one of the possible answers that was almost universally given was angels. However, we have no way to verify this claim. Only the one that is in perpetual danger is able to see the light. We have observed many near-death cases, but nothing shows up on TAR or our university's instruments. One thing that we do know is that at least one-fourth of the population of our world has come into contact with the torchbearer or knows who someone who has. I have a very old case file with me about the torchbearers and how they once saved the lives of two young kids from a very dangerous entity called Shadow Beetles. Jack and Ellie Foster's case file reads, as stated. I was really excited to go camping with my family. My elder sister, however, was not as excited as me. She complained about how she did not want to sleep on the floor with the bugs. I teased her quite a bit on the ride there, but my parents told me to stop. My sister elbowed me in the ribs. She said that if I did not stop, she would make me eat dirt. I rolled my eyes and leaned back in the seat, looking out the window as we began to see the trees. The trees were very large and became more and more dense the further we went inside the forest. My dad turned off the main road as we began to drive down a narrow dirt and gravel road. My mom asked my dad why we were going this way. He said that a friend at work camped here before and told him this was a great place to get away from all the noise and all the light pollution. This got me a little excited because it meant that we had a good chance to see the stars. My dad stopped the car in a wide, man-made clearing in the forest and then helped us unpack our things. I helped my dad set up a tent while my mom and sister began to build a small fire pit. Once finished, my dad asked me and my sister to go out and look for sticks to place into the fire pit. He told us not to wander too far. My sister was a little hesitant, but she held my hand as she led me through the forest with her. We picked up as many sticks as we could carry. It was starting to get dark and we had traveled a bit too far away from our camp and we were struggling to find our way back. My sister squeezed my hand tighter and looked very scared. I asked her what was wrong and she looked down, unable to make a sound. I looked down and saw that we were standing over a destroyed campsite. There was only a rusty car and the camp tent looked like it was torn to pieces. She said that it must have been a bear, but we did not have any food on us so we should be safe. I nodded my head, but this did not help my rising paranoia. I took a step forward and felt something snap under my foot. I looked down and saw a pale white glimmer of a bone. My sister looked at the ground too and 
pulled me off where I was standing. I did not realize that we had stumbled upon the remains of dead campers. I looked closer and saw that the bones had been cleaned off and looked fresh. Not a scrap of flesh remained on their body. I did smell something rotten, and I saw something that made my stomach churn. There was a half-eaten body with a look of pain frozen on their face. They had cuts on their face and holes as well. The lower half of their body had their intestines spread out all over the ground. My sister screamed and we began to run through the forest. We saw more and more destroyed camps as we ran. There were many skeletons of animals and humans lying on the ground as they struggled to escape the threat. As we ran, I could feel something crawling into my hair. I began to brush at it, but I couldn't feel anything. I brushed frantically and saw that my sister was doing the same. She whimpered and frantically swiped at her hair. I saw large, black, shadowy figures crawling slowly up her legs and shirt. We ran frantically through the forest, and soon we felt sharp pain in our legs. We screamed and ran, but we were getting slower. I could feel the shadowy bugs biting me more, trying to slow me down. We could see a flicker of light in front of us. I thought it was a camp, but as we got closer, I could see that the flame was moving. It was moving away from us. My sister and I screamed for help as the flame continued to move away from us. We stopped as the pain became almost unbearable and fell to the floor trying to brush away the invisible attackers. I cried as my vision became dark and I could feel the intense pain all over my body. The last thing I saw was the flame stop and then speed towards us like a fireball. I woke up later in a cave near a campfire by my sister. I was leaning up against her and could feel her arm around my waist. I looked up at her and I could see that she had many cuts all over her face and arms. I looked down at my body and I could see that there was the same. My sister Ellie looked down at me and almost cried as she hugged me, thankful that I was alive. I asked her what had happened and she told me that we were saved by a bright light. I looked over and saw a shadowy figure by the campfire. I could not make out all of his features, but he looked very old. He was wearing a raincoat that covered his long hair. He looked at us and gave me a friendly nod as his eyes glowed a dull orange. His face was scarred and his clothing looked wet despite there not being any rain in sight. Ellie looked over to me and said that the strange figure had saved us. I said thank you and the figure nodded his head slowly and pulled out a pipe from his coat pocket. He lifted the pipe to his mouth and placed his thumb on the inside of the pipe. The pipe was then filled with white smoke. The inside of the pipe glowed like the moon. The smoke from his pipe looked like it was filled with stars. I asked the man his name. He did not respond to me. He just picked up a stick from the pile in the fire. Then he used the glowing end of the stick to draw in the air. He created an image in the dark of a lantern with a flame inside. He then pointed to his chest. I asked him how old he was and he looked at me for a moment. He looked confused and looked into the distance as if he was looking for an answer. He looked back at me and shrugged. He stood up and walked over to me and plucked something off of my shoulder. I saw a black bug in his hands. It hissed angrily and tried to lash out and bite him. The strange man looked at the bug and then picked up his lantern. He flicked the bug into the lantern and burst into flames. The beetle cried in pain and then became white smoke. The figure looked at me and Allie and motioned for us to come closer. I moved closer to him hesitantly. He took our hands and then took the pipe out of his mouth. He then tapped his pipe into his hands. Two small white balls dropped out of his pipe. Then he placed one in each of our hands. He smiled and stood up. He stretched his back before humming a tune 
soon before walking out of the mouth of the cave. He then began to fade into smoke and starlight. The man then disappeared. I looked at my sister and then looked at my hand. I could feel it moving and then I heard the sound of cracking. The white ball began to hatch like an egg and something white crawled out. It looked like a small moth. It fluttered its wings a bit and looked at us before flying into the air. They began to play with each other and fluttered over to us. I smiled a bit as the moth landed on my hand. I began to walk over one of my many cups and began to spit up a bright, colorful fluid. I was disgusted at first, but then I saw the cut on my hand begin to close up and heal. I looked over to my sister and her moth was doing the same. We cautiously walked to the mouth of the cave. It was still dark, but it was starting to get a little brighter out. Our new small companions began to fly away. They waited for us as they flew not too far away. We followed the moths as they began to lead us away from the cave. We walked for a pretty long while, passing the familiarly destroyed campsites. We saw many skeletons and remains of animals. One thing crossed our minds as we began to get closer to our camp. We wondered if our parents had somehow survived. The moths rested on our shoulders and crawled all over our bodies, killing and eating the shadowy bugs. The moths began to grow and were now the size of my palm. We saw our car and saw that the lights on the inside of the car were lit up. We saw our parents in the car and saw that they were asleep. Their bodies had been badly cut up. I walked over to them with my sister, worried. We looked over at our parents and saw that they were breathing shallow breaths. I began to cry and hold my mom's hand. We begged the moths to heal our parents like they did for us. We wanted them to be safe. The moths understood what we wanted and flew over to our parents. We watched as the moths began to crawl all over them and began to heal them as well. The moths began to shrink as they healed our parents' wounds until they became the same size they were when they hatched. We stayed with our parents, watching over them and making sure that they had woken up. Once they did, they ran out of the car, hugging us and crying, thinking that the creatures of the night had eaten us alive. We packed up immediately and began to drive home that night. We never went camping again, obviously. We carried lights wherever we went and never went outside during the night. The moths that were given to us continued to protect and guide us. We learned to trust their guidance. Years later, they led us to a building when Ellie was on a trip to Arcane University. We watched as they began to fly to a strange building that looked very gothic in architecture. It was very old and the building was mostly stone, very large slabs. We were led to an office door that had the name Von Kraft on it. We opened the door and saw a pale, thin woman with golden hair sitting at her desk looking over a tablet with a magnifying glass. She wore her hair back and was wearing a white lab coat. She looked at us surprised and our little friend landed on the table as if to tell us to sit. She looked at them curiously and took out a tape recorder. She introduced herself as Dr. Von Kraft and asked if we were here to give a statement on our experience. We sat down and began to talk with her. Jack and Ellie Foster's statements both end here. My grandmother told me stories about her time at the university before the rupture. She told me that there were signs that it was going to happen. She was studying a prophecy about a great unification. She told me about a book that she used to decipher this prophecy. The date on the statement was 1986. Hmm. I think that the signs of the rupture have been going on as long as this gave me quite a shock. This does pose more questions on our history and myths and scary stories we would tell around the campfire. How many of them were true? How many of them were warnings of the rupture and we just simply played them off as nothing more than childish fantasy? 
How many thousands of lives might have been saved if we discovered the rupture before it opened and changed our world forever? I will be taking a leave of absence to do some work. I have been receiving some information for a, a case file. I'm not sure how long I will be gone, so I prepare pre-recorded lectures and I will have a substitute teacher play them for you. All right. Glasses dismissed.